Hello, and welcome to Cities.Broadcasts. Today, I'm going to be talking about why I am not, and why you, dear listener, should not be an intersectional feminist. Wikipedia description of the concept of intersectionality begins as follows. Intersectionality, or intersectional theory, is a term first coined in 1989 by American civil rights advocate and leading scholar of critical race theory, Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. It is the study of what Crenshaw contends are overlapping or intersecting social identities and related systems of oppression, domination, or discrimination. Intersectionality is the idea that multiple identities intersect to create a whole that is different from the component identities. These identities that can intersect include gender, race, social class, ethnicity, nationality, sexual orientation, religion, age, mental disability, physical disability, mental illness, and physical illness, as well as other forms of identity. These aspects of identity are not unitary, mutually exclusive entities, but rather reciprocally constructing phenomena. The theory proposes that we think of each element or trait of a person as inextricably linked with all of the other elements in order to fully understand one's identity. On the face of it, this is not an unsound concept. If we accept that certain categories of people, all other things being equal, face challenges that other categories of people do not, then it is logical assume that, to assume that having multiple marginalized identities will have a compound negative effect on one's life prospects overall. Again, all other things being equal. So what is so wrong with intersectional feminism that you should not be one? The devil is, as he, or should I say she, so often is, in the details. In an insightful article critiquing intersectional feminism, author Helen Pluckrose describes the philosophical and ideological shift that took place as intersectionality became party line in organized feminism, and by extent the state religion in all first world nations. Liberal feminist aims gradually shifted from the position everyone deserves human rights and equality and feminism focuses on achieving this for women to individuals and groups of all sexes, races, religions, and sexualities have their own truths, norms, and values. All truths, cultural norms, and moral values are equal. Those of white western heterosexual men have unfairly dominated in the past so now, they and all their ideas must be set aside for marginalized groups. Liberal feminism had shifted from the universality of equal human rights to identity politics. No longer were ideas valued on their merit, but on the identity of the speaker, and this was multifaceted, incorporating sex, gender identity, race, religion, sexuality, and physical ability. The value of an identity in social justice terms is dependent on its degree of marginalization, and these stack up and vie for, for primacy. This is where liberal feminism went so badly wrong. When post-colonial guilt fought with feminism, feminism lost. When it fought with LGBT rights, they lost too. Pluckrose details how cherry-picked postmodern philosophy enabled the jettisoning of universal liberal and egalitarian values as underpinning feminist theory and replacing it with moral and epistemological relativism. Long story short, postmodernism asserts that metaphysics and epistemology, the nature of reality and the nature of man's means of knowing reality, were, to a considerable degree, socially constructed and subjective. At the very least, it rejects the idea that there is a singular singular, overarching, meta-narrative applicable to all people at all times. Claims to objective reality were to be broken down or deconstructed to reveal that their foundations are little more than self-serving biases. 
Implicit in this was a cultural relativism that urged people not to be so judgmental of other cultures, even if those cultures appeared on the surface to be less advanced or prosperous than our own. This is not so, so bad, but it can be problematic if carried to a natural, logical extreme. If cultures and morality are truly subjective, then on what grounds can it be asserted that cultures that stress racial and gender egalitarianism are truly preferable to racist or patriarchal cultures? How could claims that universalistic liberalism was a Western social construct that could be shown to implicitly favor white males be reconciled with racial and gender equality being values belonging exclusively to Western liberalism? If such questions were posed, they were no doubt deemed taboo. The claims of critical race theory and feminist theory seemed strangely immune to postmodern deconstruction, intended to be treated as if they were eternal truths binding on all people at all times. Meta-narratives, for lack of a better word. It was just implicitly assumed that theories built around marginalized identities are infallible. Best not to say anything, though. It's not wise to point out the cherry-picking when the people doing it could make or break your academic career. Thus began the move into intersectionality that Helen Pluckrose described above. Add Peggy McIntosh's knapsack of privilege dogma that was adopted into the women's studies canon in the late 1980s, and the prejudice plus power encyclical that also became canonical and the foundations for the most toxic regressive left theory since Leninism were set. How it works is that people are all inevitably placed on several abacuses of privilege versus marginalization. Male versus female, white versus person of color, heterosexual versus LGBTQ, cisgender versus transgender, thin versus fat, able-bodied versus disabled, Christian versus atheist versus non-Christian versus Muslim. In all cases, the former identity being considered privileged relative to the latter. The tendency in intersectional feminism is to assume that incontestable moral and intellectual authority is conferred by the possession of marginalized identities. Those with fewer marginalized identities are generally expected to shut up and feel guilty about their privilege. At the very least, they are not to challenge people with more marginalized identities. Those with more marginalized identities are implicitly expected to resent their more privileged counterparts and are given full license via the prejudice plus power rationalization to abuse them as much as they want. No intersectional feminist will admit to the above paragraph, but that is the observable truth of it in action. The problems have become so glaring that even everyday feminism, the spiritual successor to Pravda, if there ever was one, has speculated that its ideological structure lends itself to abuse. Not that intersectional feminists would deal with such an accusation directly, mind you. If you are more privileged than they, they will simply point this out and, as far as they're concerned, this would shut down the argument. An exaggerated example to illustrate the way this works in practice. In a disagreement over math, wherein a white male asserted that 2 plus 2 equals 4, and a queer woman of color asserted that 2 plus 2 equals 5, typical intersectional feminist sophistry would not take the form of co coming right out and saying that the answer was 5. Instead, they'd point out that the math textbooks of the past were written by white males, and thus the queer woman of color experienced oppression while being taught most likely by a teacher who was white, cis, and straight. That 2 plus 2 made 4. Carried to its natural extreme, claims made under a marginalized person's experience of oppression in intersectional feminism can only be compared to outright divine revelation and command in fundamentalist religion in terms of being absolute in all conceivable ways, moral, metaphysical, epistemological and otherwise. These claims supersede any and everything else and to contest them is evil, with a capital E, beyond even heresy or treason. The white male would thus be chided and told to check his privilege for arguing with the queer woman of color on the matter in the first place. His insistence that 2 plus 2 made 4 would, most likely, 
with some canned formulaic copypasta response be attributed to an unwillingness to relinquish privilege, because when you are privileged, equality feels like oppression. Or something like that. Surely to God I exaggerate, he must be thinking. What kind of straw man am I building here? Well, intersectional feminism in practice is only infrequently carried this far. The logic of intersectional feminism is the logic of a closed belief system. The only permissible check on claims made by marginalized people concerning their experience of oppression is a counterclaim made by a person with more marginalized, marginalized identities still. This effect is compounded by a high degree of ideological protectionism extended to intersectional feminism in most media and academic environments. Protectionism that is naturally demanded by intersectional feminism and the natural outcome of its deterministic logic. The result is epistemic closure. The belief system contains within itself a complete system of denial of any dissent, criticism, or scrutiny. Simply claim that people with privileged identities cannot dispute claims made by people with marginalized identities without oppressing them, at least as far as their experience of oppression is concerned. This ends up creating a strong echo chamber effect wherein unquestioned agreement with claims made by persons with marginalized identities is equated to empathy and good allyship. With critical thinking and dissent suppressed in this manner, and only a single permissible vector of logical analysis of any issue pertinent to social justice, that of the harmful effects of privilege upon the marginalized, it is easy to see how intersectional feminism naturally lends itself to ever-increasing degrees of extremism. This causes believers in intersectional feminism to circle the wagons and become highly reactive when presented with claims that countermand their absolutist division of people between the marginalized and the privileged, based on identity and demographic. In response to evidence that men are not always privileged vis-a-vis -vis women, for example, such as in divorced court proceedings, intersectional feminists will often do just about everything, except accede to the truth of the claims made in defense of men's rights. Typical responses include becoming triggered or offended, and demand that the countermanding claim be withdrawn out of empathy, empathy for a marginalized person. This often works, as critics are often reluctant to stir up too much controversy, creating a preemptive chill effect against making men's rights-related claims by casting men's rights activists in a bad light, suggesting that they are misogynistic trolls, live in their parents' basements, can't get laid, a strange reason for feminists to devalue men, since reducing sexual contact between the genders to a vanishing point is an unstated but nonetheless paramount goal of feminism, and so on. Usurping institutional power and using it to deny platforms to men's rights activists, shutting them down on social media, denying media exposure, no platforming them at college campuses, and so on. Expect lots of references to angry white dudes, or the like. Often some witty portmanteau, mansplaining or white-splaining, and likewise clever and satirical misspellings of dude or why people. This kind of vacuous signaling is used by intersectionalists to epistemically ward themselves against dangerous lines of reasoning by metaphorically shooting the messenger. The Manichaean worldview presented by intersectional feminists, the stark contrast between the privileged and the marginalized with no middle ground or shades of grey, serves to disincentivize critical thought. Who would want to lend succor to the enemy if the enemy is the absolute manifestation of pure evil and tyranny, literally Hitler? This also incentivizes the demonization of non-believers, as exposure to challenging lines of thought must be minimized if the influence of privileged and oppressive, oppressive worldviews is to likewise be minimalized, hence their penchant for censorship. To this end, they've made an art form of disingenuous and deceptive argumentation. Expect lots of bulverism, 
short and vague responses that imply that you've crossed some unseen line placing you beyond the pale of reason, morality, or respect for saying what you've said, no matter how reasonable on the surface of it. Wow, just wow, is the order copy pasta here. Argument from intimidation, implying that any and all dissent is equivalent to racism, misogyny, or fascism, is par for the course and a built-in feature of intersectional feminism as a belief system. Greenwalding, intentionally taking parts of opponents' statements out of context in order to make them say something very different than what they were intended to say, is also common. So too common are more common logical and referential fallacies, including slippery slopes and moving goalposts. True Scotsmen are almost unheard of among intersectional feminists. Two wrongs making a right is the basis of much of its prejudice plus power moral system. The fallacy of relative deprivation is pretty much what intersectional feminism is all about. Showing that you get it is of paramount importance. Dogpiling on naysayers is one of the very, very few actions that privileged sympathizers that, for reasons I can't fathom, seem to be vast in number, can be almost assured of approval of from their more marginalized superiors. Appeals to authority come with the territory here. Emotional reasoning is rampant. A marginalized person's being triggered is considered oppressive, no matter the intent behind the action that caused said triggering. Bootlegged videos of SJW meltdowns, the kind so often captured at Milo Yiannopoulos lectures, are a result of this. Catastrophization underlies the dogma of the microaggression, where even the most innocuous actions or gestures on part of the privileged are taken as indicative of privilege and oppression, and therefore just grounds to trigger a marginalized person. The privileged, of course, are completely responsible, regardless of intent, and cannot argue for reasons outlined above. The ends always justify the means with intersectional feminists. As with Lenin and his historical idea of kato kovo, translating into who whom, actions are judged not on the basis of whether they are right or wrong, but by who benefits and who suffers as a result of them. There is no recourse or appeal for the privileged. Another Leninist trait is vanguardism. Intersectional feminists make bold statements on behalf of entire demographics of people. Are they really speaking for all blacks or all women? Or are they speaking for the women's studies department or the black studies department? Big difference. Compounded with the epistemically closed nature of intersectional feminism previously described, this is among its most dangerous characteristics. A small but well-organized and ideologically cohesive group can use the marginalized identities they are professing to represent in order to shield themselves from scrutiny and opposition, as well as to justify such repressive measures as are within their grasp. Replace marginalization versus privilege with class struggle, and this is exactly what happened in the USSR, and why it became the kind of place it did. Suffice it to say, this is hardly a recipe for mental health or satisfactory relationships. Frankly, I do not think it out of the question that there is a disproportionate prevalence of cluster B personality disorders within intersectional feminist ranks. Like fascism, fundamentalism, and Stalinism, intersectional feminism is a completely closed and completely authoritarian system. This kind of thinking has been shown with such examples as the Stanford Prison Experiment and the Milgram Shock Experiment to bring about blind obedience to authority regardless of who is getting hurt and can even attract outrightly sadistic personalities. As Nazi and Stalinist examples demonstrate, absolute power combined with a legitimizing ideology is a formula for atrocity. Of course, intersectional feminism is guilty of nothing on the scale of the Holocaust or the Holodomor. But honestly, the only thing holding them back at this point is not having the power. 
but they are given carte blanche in most media and academic environments. This should be troubling for everybody. No idea should be above criticism. Sacred cows walk the road into regressive darkness. Not all intersexual nilfeminists are malignant psychopathic nutjobs. Many, if not most, are well-meaning people who generally want to give voice to the downtrodden. The problem is not that every or even most intersectional feminists are bad people. The problem is that intersectional feminism as a belief system is both tightly closed and, quite ironically, extremely hierarchical. And this does attract antisocial or at least authoritarian people. People who are decidedly uncomfortable with ambiguity and have a psychological need for a belief system with a clear and simple delineation between good and bad, but can't or won't find this in its traditional source, religion. Many, too, deal with psychological problems stemming from abuse, bad upbringings, or a general lack of self-esteem that they find easy to project onto other people or society as a whole via intersectional feminist rationalizations, as opposed to the challenging work of seeking therapy and healing via challenging themselves. Now, beware of psychologizing people, however, unless you have good cause to do so unless you've observed clearly bizarre behavior, or as they do surprisingly frequently, the intersectional feminist just comes right out and tells you they have issues. I see this in blog posts and magazine articles quite consistently, especially when feminists blog about their sexual hang-ups and issues with men. You are not a trained professional psychologist unless you are one. As such, keep poor mental health as a possible explanatory factor for truly unhinged behavior in the back of your mind, as opposed to it being a go-to response that you can use to easily and conveniently hand-wave any claims you disagree with or that challenge you. It also bears mentioning that economic inequality is regarded as being of lesser importance to intersectional feminism, or at the very least tends to surface much less frequently. And when it does surface, class is treated much as race, gender, and so on are, as an identity. This is a distortion of the nature of economic class as a vector of identity and of a form of oppression. Class is attributable to relations of production, not an immutable genetic trait. This basically refers to how you earn your money. Is it from profits or dividends or rents derived from ownership of productive capital? or from selling your time and labor in exchange for a salary in order to make ends meet, or some combination of the two. A related problem with intersectional feminism is that in attributing privilege to genetic factors such as race, gender, or sexual orientation, the real halls of power, big business and big government, tend to escape scrutiny. Perhaps that is why media and academia like intersectional feminism as much as they do. And libertarians have no less reason to balk at intersectional feminists than Marxists do. The smallest and most marginalized minority of them all is the individual, who turns out to be completely invisible in intersectional feminist praxis. If at all possible, do not deal with intersectional feminists unless they show you that they are at least open to other points of view especially steer clear of them if they demonstrate abusive or manipulative behaviors. Do not allow yourself to become subject to their authority. A common intersectional feminist strategy is to assume positions of influence and authority within organizations and use them to impose their will. Stop them if you can, or leave organizations wherein this happens, if you are able. And for the love of God, do not, do not, do not, do not let them convince you that they are within their rights to control, manipulate, or abuse you in any way, in any way, simply because they have more marginalized identities than you, and because guilt by association and collective responsibility. You do not owe this to them. Let me make that crystal clear. You don't owe it to anyone to be a doormat. On the other hand, do listen to, with an open mind to claims made by intersectional feminists regarding the realities of life for marginalized people, 
they can be valuable repositories of knowledge regarding specific social issues, so don't be so quick to hand wave them. Not uncommonly, they advocate for some good reforms. If you can sort through the dogmatism and moral absolutism and panic, and get to the legitimate claims. Also, resist the temptation to what aboutery in a vain attempt to establish moral equivalency. You will not convince them. Sometimes agreeing with them, especially when warranted, can disarm them. Sometimes. I do not condemn intersectional feminism because, as a white dude, I get short shrift from it. That is sufficient reason to condemn it, but that is not its greatest sin. What is truly damning about intersectional feminism is its betrayal of the core values of racial and gender equality. It turns all of our backs on the reasons we abandoned racism and sexism in the first place. Because people are more than their genitals, their skin color, or who they're sexually attracted to. And people want to be, and deserve to be, evaluated on more than just those characteristics. People told to check their privilege rightly feel objectified, reduced to bare biological characteristics, by the praxis of inter intersectional feminism, just as victims of racial and sexual discrimination once did, and sometimes too frequently still do. That was what made bona fide social justice worth fighting for in the first place. White people can and should have opportunities to enjoy healthy and mutually beneficial relationships with people of color. That, it seems to me, is what will erode racism. Men can and should have opportunities to enjoy healthy and mutually beneficial relationships with women. If anything's going to get rid of sexism, should be that. Straight people can and should have opportunities to enjoy healthy and mutually beneficial relationships with LGBTQ people. Want to kill homophobia? That's how I would do it. And in all of the above cases, these relationships should be between human beings, not merely political labels and identities. Plus, poor and working class people should have opportunities to benefit from a progressive movement centered around economic inequality and keeping money out of politics and the opportunity to rise as high as their talents and efforts will allow them. These opportunities benefit everybody. Guilt and shame on behalf of the privileged, together with resentment and self-righteous entitlement for the marginalized, benefit no one. For a fleeting sense of self-righteousness, the marginalized people who accept intersectional feminism's Faustian bargain lose all of the aforementioned opportunities. As I write this, the greatest threat to these opportunities comes not from the Ku Klux Klan or the homophobic and puritanical fundamentalist preachers. Rather, the greatest threat now comes from those who have usurped the mantle of good and just causes that brought us to the brink of victory over the Klansmen and the fundamentalist. That victory now begins to slip away. We must take it back. These have been Simeus.Broadcasts. Thank you for listening. Over and out.